Hello and welcome. This is Rufal Monger, my friends. This is the beginner's guide for Tekken 8. We're going to be covering just basically everything you can do in Tekken 8. Some of the stuff kind of easy, kind of self-explanatory. We'll still go over it though. And some of the concepts, the game doesn't really go out of its way to teach you some of these concepts. So we're going to try to teach you everything we can just about how the game works in general. There'll be timestamps. So skip forward to whatever section makes sense for you. And otherwise, let's start here with just the absolute basics. So first off, Tekken is what we would call a four button game. There's four main attack buttons here. We have left punch, right punch, left kick, and right kick. And otherwise known as one, two, three, and four. Every button corresponds to a limb. And therefore, it's actually fairly easy even if you don't know all the moves, if you see Reina attacking with her right kick specifically, it's probably something that uses the right kick button because, you know, the left punch button wouldn't be hitting with right kicks, right? So even if you're watching something and you don't know exactly what's going on, just by looking at what button is actually attacking, you can get a rough idea of what's happening. Now that said, also the game being the game here, uh, we have a lot of different directions. Generally speaking, a bunch of different directions and a button is gonna give you different results. Like say, stand one, not hitting anything besides one, is gonna be different than down forward one is gonna be different than back one, right? And much the same here for any other button here. Stand four, down forward four, back four, right? Effectively, just about any direction and a button will yield you a move. And some moves use both buttons. Generally, if it uses both buttons being the game, it means they're using both limbs. So one, left punch, right punch, and one plus two uses both arms. This cartwheel kick here from Reyna, three plus four, because we're using both legs. And that's about it. But given that all these buttons and directions make different moves, that's why Tekken move lists tend to be longer than the average fighting game, because there's so many possibilities, as you can see. Now, another big part of Tekken is movement. So yes, this is a 3D game. Therefore, you have basically free movement of whatever arena you may be in. There's basic concepts like back dashing, just hit back back, forward dashing, where you can dash or hold to run. And to run, you do have to be just a little bit further from the enemy. You can sidestep, just tap up or down and sidestep into the front or background. And if you double tap and then hold, then you'll walk in that direction. So down, down, hold, and I'm starting to walk into the camera. And Tekken being Tekken, you can actually pretty, for the most part, freely cancel any kind of movement into any other movement. So if I back dash, I can cancel my back dash into a sidestep and I can cancel, say, my sidestep into a dash. So back dash, sidestep, forward dash, right? And that's kind of one of the key parts of Tekken. So when you see people just kind of moving around here, we're just flitting around, that's why, because you can kind of freely control how you move. It's a pretty big deal. And there is some advanced techniques where you can get really special kinds of movement, although that won't be for this video. Don't worry, there'll be other guides for that. This is also a back to block game. So like say Street Fighter, hold backwards to block mids and highs, hold down back to block lows. Also, this game has a feature what we call neutral blocking, where normally you can see here I'm holding backwards, I'll block the strike, but I can also hold exactly no buttons and I'll block the strike. And this works for standing as well as crouching. So as Usena is attacking me here, if I hold down back, I'll block, but if I just hold regular down, I'll neutral block as well. Now that said, don't always let the game just block for you. There are actually many situations where you can regular hold back the block where you cannot neutral block as neutral blocking does take a little bit to get set up. It's uh, on when it's on, but it doesn't go on right away, especially after you're doing things like attacking. So holding back is a much more reliable way to defend yourself. And plus you gain space holding back, so that helps. But just keep in mind, sometimes if you don't want to see ground, you can neutral block. Now we mentioned attacks. So there's three kinds of attacks. There's highs, there's mids, and there's lows. And being the kind of game it is, highs are generally just gonna be your fastest attacks, no matter what. If it's high, it's just gonna be quicker than any other comparable move. The issue though, highs are duckable. As you can see here, Azusan is crouching now, and no matter what I may do, all my high attacks are just not gonna hit at all. And that's not great, because if a big high goes over her head, you can get punished for it, right? So they're your fastest kinds of attacks, but they have a pretty sizable weakness in that they can just hold down and they all go over your head. And it's as simple as that. Now mids, what makes mids so strong is you cannot duck them, right? 
And more specifically, while you're crouching, you cannot block them either. You can stand block a mid, but you cannot crouch block a mid. So here, stand blocking, no big deal. Crouch blocking, impossible. Not gonna work. So you really gotta watch out because sometimes ducking in that high is a pretty big deal, but if you guess wrong and a mid's coming your way, you're gonna get blown up for it. So mids are slower than highs, but they're potentially a lot deadlier because when you think you're safe ducking a high, you might get blown up by the mid instead. And then that brings us to lows and lows are a little self-explanatory. Lows are low. And to defeat them, you must block low. Simple as that. Lows are generally very negative on block. Almost every low is punishable in some way, shape or form. It could be a little punish, it could be a big punish, but lows are the quick sniping moves. In this game, because mids are so scary, you generally always want to stand block. And therefore, a lot of what the game is, is just quickly sniping people with lows. Just make them not pay attention. While they're worrying about mids and highs, you snipe in a little low to hit them. But if the low gets caught, it's potentially the most devastating as it's the easiest to punish a low of the three attack heights. And there's some other things with lows we'll talk about later in the video as well. Now, this being a 3D game and you have 3D movement, you can also just get out of the way of moves. You can sidestep a lot of moves in this game. So if you know a move is coming your way, you can kind of just preemptively get out of the way of it, right? Like that's a pretty big part of the game is you knowing what's coming next and then you either ducking or sidestepping or whatever to evade the move. Now, keep in mind, certain moves are actually kind of tailor-made to beat sidestepping. Uh, you'll see the blue flash on them specifically. It looks like a claw effect. If you see this, you are not sidestepping that move because it'll catch both sides. And sometimes, due to the nature of the game and the nature of animations, a move, even if it doesn't have the anti-sidestep property, uh, it might just naturally be good at catching certain sidesteps. Sometimes the move is really good at catching sidesteps to the left, but it's really bad at catching sidesteps to the right. And that's uh, one of those things where uh, we call these knowledge checks. You kind of just have to know by playing the game. You got to put in the time, right? Because knowing that could be the difference between winning or losing, that a specific move might have a weakness of sidestepping one way or to the other. So that's sort of the basics. We have four buttons to work with here, all sorts of attacks, all sorts of movement. Movement is kind of at the heart of what Tekken is. So now that you know the absolute basics, let's get more into the weeds about the system mechanics. Now let's talk the heat system. That's the blue bar underneath your health. Now, just to note really quick, we do have a video already on the channel going really in depth on the heat system. And you can find a link to that in the video description. So if you want to get really into the weeds, that video is there. But for now, let's give you the basics. So this is something you have available to you every round. So it doesn't matter if you used it all up one round, it'll always be back for you at the beginning of the next completely full. So frankly, there's no reason not to make sure you use it every round. And while the meter is going, you glow, the meter drains, and basically a lot of your best moves are now available to you. So while the heat is live, what happens? Well, generally speaking, one, all your moves will now do chip damage. So you're just offensively much stronger because no matter what, the enemy is always going to take chip from the attacks. Doesn't matter if it's even the most basic punch. It just makes your general offense stronger. It also unlocks the use of one of your super moves called the heat smash. Using this will drain all your remaining bar, no matter how full it is. And heat smash is generally a very powerful cinematic attack. So they're very much worth the cost. You only get to do these once around. And it unlocks special traits for your character. Now what traits it unlocks is different character to character. Everyone gets something different out of heat mode. Like let's take Reyna for example. She has a special stance here, Heaven's Wrath stance. And she can do various attacks from it that are all very useful. And specifically while she's in the heat mode, when in the stance, the stance then becomes a counter move. So when the enemy attacks, attack right into her and she'll stomp you silly for daring to attack her while the move is live. And this is only when you're in the heat mode, and this is only for Reyna. And there's actually quite a bit more than that, even for Reyna, but for everybody gives them all unique traits. Your character is the best version of themselves while the heat is live. And how do we get into the heat? Well, there's two main ways. There's the heat burst, where you just simply hit a stance and then you immediately go into it. It'll be an attack. The attack is always very slightly advantage on block. So don't worry if it gets blocked, it's still your turn effectively. Another lovely trait of the heat burst attack is it has armor on it. So as you saw there, we can actually armor through this move coming our way. So the armor doesn't happen immediately, but still it's a defensive offensive attack and it puts you right into the heat state. And if for whatever reason you don't want the attack from the heat burst activation, just hit back back and they'll do a quick taunt instead. 
There is also specific attacks called heat engagers, and you can easily find these, by the way, in your move list, so don't worry about that. It's not a mystery. But a heat engager, if it connects, it just automatically puts you into heat mode. No worries. And actually, it gives you more heat bar than the raw heat burst activation, so it's actually more beneficial to go in heat mode with one of these attacks. And after it connects, you can see there's a little cinematic here. What's happening here is you have extreme advantage over your opponent. Nothing's guaranteed, but generally speaking, if you both hit the same move at the same time, the person who just activated here is always going to win. So this is a good opportunity to try to mix up your foe. Now, besides that, we have the heat smash, the super we talked about here. There's also another way to burn the heat meter. That is the heat dash. So when you're in heat, any move that is a heat engager, like we just talked about here a moment ago here, those moves now allow for heat dashes. Just do the move and hold forward. Simple as that. Nothing else. There was no trickery, no complex uh, button pressing here. So do your heat engager move. Just hold forward. It'll usually bounce them up or give you some sort of combo ability after the fact. And then you can just go from there. Depending on the situation, this can be even more advantageous for you than going into your big fancy heat smash super move. So keep that in mind. And that's some of the basics of the heat system. Once again, check the companion heat video if you want to learn more in the video description. Now let's talk the rage system. So for easy use here in training mode, we're just going to enter it manually. As you can see here, rage is now on, but generally rage is only available when you're very low health. It's effectively your comeback mechanic. It's quite simple, but still let's talk about it. So once again, the main purpose of rage is effectively as a little bit of a comeback mechanic. So let's take a move like forward, forward, four for Reyna, big ax stick, right? As you can see here, it does 20 damage. Now, if we were to turn on the rage here, or if we were otherwise low health in a real match, when this move connects, and now it does 22 damage. You just get a flat across the board 10% damage bonus. So it's not gonna give you comebacks for free or anything, but in key situations where you might not have beat the enemy otherwise, and you just get a few points more damage per your combo, that can mean everything, and that can mean the difference between winning or losing. So that's a nice little trick, right? But the other big deal is the rage art. So this is everyone's gigantic, big cinematic super move, right? Uh, the cinematic obviously is different for every single character, but the net effect is the same in that they do something really cool and do a hell of a lot of damage. To do a rage art, it's very simple. It's simply down forward one plus two. And it's the same for every single character. Doesn't matter what character you are, the input is universal. Also, the rough attack is roughly universal as well. Like, yeah, everyone does their cool different cinematic, but the strike is always gonna be basically the same with the basic same range. And uh, more importantly for the defender, it's also very universal on block. So if the rage art gets blocked, that will be negative 15 frames across the board. And for a lot of how this game works, negative 15 is actually sort of a magic number as it's where a lot of characters can do launchers on you. For most of the cast, a launcher is simply down forward and two at the same time, and it launches you in the air and you can do a big combo. And that's for most, not everybody, but for most of the cast, exactly 15 frames. So if you block a rage art, that means you get a guaranteed juggle combo. Now for the actual rage art attack, what really helps it as part of like a comeback panic mechanic here is the startup is also armored. So you can get hit while it's happening here. You see as a Senna hit me, right? doesn't particularly matter I'll still tank through it and then that's it right now if you don't have enough health to survive the hit you will still die FYI so like it's not going to save you in situations where you should have lost but if you have just a little bit of health left to survive whatever hit you're going through it'll help you just tank right through it and then get that big damage and maybe win the match although one thing to note the armor on the move doesn't start exactly immediately so if you're doing it as a panic move you got to make sure there's at least a little space to breathe and that's the rage mechanic. It's pretty simple. It's a slight damage buff across the board and it gives you access to your most powerful attack. Now let's talk the power crush. So this is effectively what armor is. There's armor effects in most fighting games. This is how Tekken does it. So every character has at least one power crush attack. Some characters have more. So for example here for Reyna, back one plus two is the power crush. And you may notice here, uh, the white sparks, this is universal. Every attack that has a power crush attached to it will have some sort of white sparks. So while there's white sparks, you have armor frames. So how armor works specifically in Tekken is it can destroy all mids and highs. So if you got mids or highs coming your way, you can just kind of tank through them, right? You will take some recoverable damage, which we'll talk about later in the video, but 
Other than that, you can kind of safely go through the move. Now, the thing is, it cannot stop lows. Try as you may. If there's a low coming, it doesn't matter if you're like well into your armor frames, you're just going to get hit. Lows just kind of automatically beat power crush moves. The only way it doesn't is, as you can see there, is if the power crush hits first, which at that point is whatever, right? But yeah, so you can defend against mids and highs, but not lows with the universal armor power crush mechanic. Now, an important thing to note about power crush moves is the majority of them, but not all, but the majority of them are slightly punishable on block. They'll be anywhere from like negative 10, negative 11, negative 12, negative 13, which means the opponent's gonna get some damage in on you for blocking them. Uh, there's a few rare exceptions of safe power crush moves like Jack 8 has one, for example, but generally you're gonna eat a little guaranteed damage if it's blocked, unless in the situations where you can armor through a move and they can still block, then it'll be safe. Uh, it's still negative, but as you can see here, negative eight on block, that's safe on block. So if you made the right call, but they still blocked in the end, you're at the very least always going to have some safety to it. Kind of across the board for many power crush attacks, you will find that the property of the attack changes a bit if you successfully armor a move. And keep in mind too, lots of characters have multiple power crush attacks, right? And they can all do different things. Like Reyna also has one from her twirl stance, right? Uh, this one has a different defensive value. This is a negative 14. There's negative 13 here, right? Which means on the right character, slightly more punishable, but it gives you ways to kind of mess around, right? The more armored options you have, the better you can kind of steal turns from the enemy. Now, this next one is an important but very useful mechanic as it's universal. Every single character in the game has the ability to do this, and that is the universal low parry. So we talked about how the power crush action like, catches mids and highs, right? But what about lows? Well, this is what everyone can do. And it's actually very easy, although there's an element of timing. So if someone's coming at you and attacking you with lows, right? Well, that's annoying. You don't want that. So a universal low parry is actually very easy. All you have to do is when the low comes, hit down and forward, just diagonally. And when you do it correctly, you'll just sort of flip them on their head. And uh, one benefit to this, the timing window is uh, mildly generous for what it is. It's not like some strict one frame deal. Just when you feel the attack coming, hit diagonal down forward. And if you have a rough timing window, you'll send them on their way. And naturally, you might notice here from the bounce, you can absolutely combo. So the thing about this specifically is you might not always get the biggest combo. You'll get guaranteed damage, absolutely. But it does use up what we call the tornado state. So when you launch a character and you do moves that extend the state of the combo like this right there, that's the state that's used up in the low parry. So you cannot get overly elaborate combos, but you do get the guaranteed damage. Another side benefit, I guess, of a low parry is if you guess wrong. So if you go for the low parry and you guess wrong, there was no low coming your way, but it was a high instead. Hey, you still ducked. So the high went over your head. Although on the flip, if you guessed wrong and it was a mid, well, you're getting blown up. But that's the nature of incorrect guessing, I suppose. Sometimes you luck out, sometimes you don't. But yeah, so every character in the game can do this as simple as just tapping diagonal down forward, and that's it. Just have decent timing and you'll get it. It doesn't matter how fast the low is, how slow it is, how big it is, how much damage it does. Universal, if you catch a low, you'll flip them on their head. So if you're in the enemy's head and you know what they're gonna do and they're just doing those like quick little weak pokes just to frustrate you, you can turn that quick little poke into some substantial damage. Now, next up, we're gonna talk the importance of counter hits. So counter hits, it's a basic enough concept on paper anyways. You know, you and your opponent, you're gonna be mashing nonstop at each other, attacking, 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 and eventually one of you is gonna hit the other, right? Naturally enough. And probably gonna knock someone else out of their move every now and then. And this is where counter hits come into play. When a move hits its counter hit, it does a little more damage. So hey, that's a nice little benefit. But more importantly, certain moves gain new properties on counter hit. So let's look at Nina here, right? Forward and three. All right, kind of basic double kick. Looks pretty cool. Knocks the enemy back, right? What's not to like there? However, certain moves gain new properties and very powerful properties on counter hit. Like say Nina's forward three. So on its face, just kind of kicks you in the face, right? Well, there you go, that rhymes. But yeah, that's kind of it. But on counter hit, so now you can see here Azucena is just attacking me. So if I choose to knock her out of the move here with a counter hit, that's that move we used earlier, right? And look at that. Instead of knocking the enemy very far away, they kind of just crumple like a sack of potatoes in front of her face. And naturally enough, that certainly means we can get some combo potential.
All right, not a bad chunk of damage, right? Certainly a lot more than just sending them on their way. And that's specifically the power of the counter hit. And in this game, there's lots of situations where you can kind of help enforce a counter hit. There are many moves in the game that are what we call plus on block. They're advantage on block. Basically, you recover before the enemy does. You can see this in the frame advantage. If it's any kind of blue, you recover first. And the number being higher just is better and better. So people who, after blocking, just refuse to stop hitting buttons, plus frames is a great way to make them stop hitting buttons. Like, say Azusana here. She just won't stop mashing after blocking, right? She just fears, after the block, I get to do whatever I want to do. And we can punish her big time for it. So once again here, we're going to use our move, forward three. That's our counter hit move. Let's see what happens. Now that we know we're going to go first for sure. Once again, pretty big chunk of damage, right? So you're in situations where you know you have a slight advantage over the enemy and they won't stop hitting buttons to save their life, very literally. Then find your moves that do extra effects on counter hit. It can be as simple as just going to practice settings. You can always have player counter turned on and then just sort of go through your moves. And certain moves that have counter hit properties, like say our forward three, right? If there's usually any kind of like counter hit bonus, there's probably gonna be a very dramatic camera shift. Or you can just set a button up to key charge and try it out as well. Nina, forward forward three, uh, kick to the nether regions, right? So as a counter hit, that's extra bad. You don't want that, right? So just mess around with the moveset, see what your counter hit moves are. Generally speaking, they're usually gonna be some of your more valuable moves. Now let's just look at the general basic anatomy of a combo. Generally speaking, combos for Tekken, Combos come off launchers. You do whatever move and it knocks them up in the air. For most of the cast, not everybody, but most of the cast, just hit down forward and two, and that's a launcher. And they'll go up into the air and you can do whatever you want. So to give you a basic example of a combo here. So what are all these constituent parts of this combo? So first, hey, okay, well, there's the launcher, right? After that, I'm just sneaking in a little hit just for some extra damage. And then after that, I'm hitting for her specifically down two, three, which will send the enemy flying, leaves me in one of my stances. And from there, I'm gonna hit one plus two, this giant old uppercut. And from that point, that big old uppercut causes the flip state. So we call this the tornado, it used to be called the screw, you can call it whatever you want. If you go into your move list specifically, moves that have the little spin icon, this is what causes that state. And it's effectively a combo extending move. Now, no matter how big, no matter how elaborate your combo is, that specific flip knockdown state is always the same, whether it's two hits or 200 hits. So you can always have a kind of universal combo point. Now, once you hit that point, you're getting close to near the end of your combo, right? Because their back's on the ground, it's gonna be hard to be keeping them in the air, but still it's a universal state. You'll be using it for almost every single combo. You can't use it for low parry specifically, as we talked earlier in the video, because uh, low parry uses that state, but you're gonna be using it for everybody. So just to give you a couple ideas, a couple of examples here. Oh, there's that state. And then we end off our combo. Sometimes combos can be a bit more elaborate, a lot of stance shifting and all that kind of stuff. And that state will come later in the combo, but it'll always almost come. Also in combos, keep in mind the wall. Many combos will bring you to the wall and you never know when you might hit one and go from there, right? The wall is your ally, helps you maximize your damage. And one more example here. I'm sure you're getting the idea at this point. Okay, there's our big tornado. We're near the wall. Let's use it. Why not? And just kind of go from there, right? So those are the basics. But not every combo comes off a big launcher. Some combos are completely grounded. Like say Asuka Ford Ford 2. If it connects at all, it's plus 14. And generally, not always, but generally after a move connects and you're both still standing, that means whatever the frame number may say, if you can have a move that's that fast or faster, it should be able to connect. So for our sake here, we'll use down back one, which is exactly 14 frames. So if this connects, this connects, two hit combo. And also has a string attached to it. So there we go, we got a nice three hit combo, right? So sometimes on bigger hits that leave people standing, if the numbers are big enough, you can still combo even when they're completely grounded. 
this will generally be more prevalent on counter hits because you'll really know because the screen will do some fancy uh, camera work there. Like Zafina forward forward three on its own. Yeah, it's kind of whatever, right? If it hits as a counter hit. Okay, camera went all crazy there. So something's up. And if we look at our handy dandy frame counter, if it hits as a counter hit specifically, along with that screen stop, also plus 14, right? And they're both standing, so I should be able to hit. And sure enough here, I get a grounded combo from it. So keep that in mind, not every combo is the big fancy launcher. Now let's talk throws and Tekken. So for this section, we're gonna sub out Reyna and bring in King, cause dude's kind of an authority on the matter. Let's put it that way, right? Now, why are throws important? At bare minimum, if someone just keeps blocking your moves, well, guess what? You can't block a throw, right? Really that simple. And the thing about throws, with rare exception, is throws are always gonna hit you standing. So if you happen to be crouching specifically, throws as highs will go clear over your head. Although beware, there's a rare few characters that have crouching throws in that they are specifically designed you to throw you while you're crouching. So you might get buried just for trying to make the smart move. So the throw in and of itself, sort of self-explanatory, right? You can't block it, does good damage for the most part, good way to continue your offense. The real thing about throws in Tekken specifically is not doing throws, but dealing with throws. And how do we deal with throws? We tech them. Teching a throw means no matter how big, how bad you are, throws coming your way, you'll find a way out. Some of these have kind of elaborate animations, as you can see, sometimes it's just quick get off me, right? But yeah, if you tech a throw, you don't take any damage. But teching a throw is both a combination of somewhat of a knowledge check, but also a visual reaction check. So for the most part, there's three kinds of throws. There are throws where you reach out with your left hand. Those are broken by hitting the one button. There are throws where you reach out with your right hand. Those are broken by hitting the two button. And there are throws where you reach out with both hands. And those are broken by hitting one and two at the exact same time. Now keep in mind, specifically in Tekken 8, generic throws where you just hit one plus three or three plus four, they can be broken by one or two. It doesn't matter. So if you kind of mash, you'll always just break a generic throw. So Azusan is just gonna be mashing your basic throws, right? And as a basic throw, I can break with one or two. I'll just mash one, just to show you. So both throws will come my way, and it doesn't really matter which one's gonna be which. One breaks both of them, right? Because it's just a generic throw, I don't actually have to guess. I just hit one if I see the throw, and then I'm out of dodge, no big deal. But for more elaborate throws besides the basics, then you have to guess. So now let's set Dragonov as our opponent here. Dragonov has a lot of good throws. And specifically, he utilizes all the throw breaks. So now, when he's going to throw us, we actually really do have to pay attention to which arm he's using. Because they demand that specific break. It's not generic like the Azucena grab we showed, right? So if he's going with his left arm, we have to break with a 1. If he's going with his right arm, we have to break with a 2. And now things are going to get a little harder, right? I actually kind of have to look at the arm. I have to know. And if I can tell, I can tell. Oh, right there. I screwed up. I hit the wrong one, right? So... This is a little trickier, right? You have to visually see which one's going to be which. The answer is in front of you. It's just upon you to do the right move. Now, Tekken has what is probably the most generous throw tech window in fighting game history. But even then, you won't get them all. Sometimes you just misread the move. Sometimes you panicked and hit the wrong button. Sometimes you were just asleep at the wheel. It doesn't really matter. You can't catch them all. Now, especially someone like Dragonov, he also has all three throw breaks. So now you have to see, is it going to be a one break, a two break, or a one plus two break? And you can still visually tell, it just gets harder when there's three things on the plate. It can still be done, right? Like, it's doable, but you got to be really paying attention. Of course, the easy way out is, once again, can't get thrown if you're ducking, right? You can just kind of pop them up on their way and just go from there. Now, there is a little cheating aspect to this, uh, specifically for King, and maybe later DLC characters down the road. King has moves that have the exact same throw animation, but have completely different breaks. Specifically, Giant Swing's one of them, and also the Shining Wizard. So, in those situations, you literally just have to guess. You cannot know. Even if you're a god and you can react every single time, it doesn't matter. It's not going to save you. You just got to guess. Uh, that's why King's the grappler, right? Now, don't feel bad if you can't tech every throw. Most people can't. Only at the highest, most absolute 
elite levels of Tekken is Tekken throws even common to begin with, right? Anything other than elite level, most people are just gonna get grabbed unless you're just really obvious about your throws. Also character to character, grabs are weighted, like for Jack here, right? His main one grab is the pile driver and it's all right. His main one plus two grab is a different kind of pile driver. One's a package pile driver, one's a more traditional pile driver for the wrestling fans out there. Uh, but the main event is the two grabs and he has two very powerful two grabs. He's got the backbreaker, which can uh, effectively guarantee follow-up damage, so it's a lot of damage. And he can also toss you up like a piece of trash, right? And tossing up like a piece of trash kind of guarantees big combos. So both of those were two breaks, both the backbreaker and the big launcher, right? So against Jack, if you don't know which one and you just have to guess, he's gonna get his maximum reward off two breaks, uh, the throws that are a two break, right? So if you've got a guess, just jam on two. Maybe you guessed wrong and he went for a different one. I don't know, right? But if your life's on the line, the two break is the important break against Jack. And that's the case for a lot of the characters, right? You can kind of break them down to which is the best grab, the optimal grab they always wanna go for. For Jack, it'd be two. For other characters, it's different. So even if you can't react, just keep in mind, if you learn the characters, they generally have the one grab scenario they wanna go for. And that is effectively grab 101 in Tekken 8. Now this is just a little bonus section to the throw section. So a few points to mention about throws when they're just more difficult or just impossible to break. So throws, well, they can hit from all sorts of angles, right? Like here's the basic throw, but if I hit from say the side, it becomes a different move, right? And if I hit from the back specifically, you can tell here, uh, much more damaging too, right? A uh, back throws specifically, no matter the character, are always inescapable. That's just the penalty for you getting got, right? If they uh, are back turned, you can be potentially eating a lot of damage off a back turn throw. So keep that in mind, back turn throws, if you manage to maneuver your way around them, always inescapable. Also, if a throw hits as a counter attack, like you throw them in the middle of their attack, the tech window gets much smaller, so it's not as generous as it is, uh, to the point where it's almost near impossible to break, even if you know exactly which throw is coming. So if you are throwing people out of moves, or more specifically, if you know they're gonna attack and do something, throwing them out of it is actually very reasonable because it's almost impossible to break. And specifically, there's actually ways to force it to become impossible to break. So if you hit a move with armor properties, like a power crush, or a defensive move like a counter attack, you may notice here this little flash when the throw connects. That means the throw is now unbreakable no matter what. So if people are using defensive maneuvers and you throw them out of a defensive maneuver, the throw is always unbreakable. So if you can predict armor or a parry or whatever is coming, go for the throw because it's then guaranteed. Also, just to quickly note, there is a handful of wacky throws that are just untackable no matter what. Uh, they're generally very slow startup, so you kind of deserve it for getting hit, but there you go. Now let's talk recoverable life. You may notice here Reyna in the corner here on their life bar, some of it's missing. Well, that's uh, how the game works now. So you can take chip damage from various sources and if someone's in heat mode, all their attacks do chip damage. But thankfully, it's actually uh, fairly easy to recover because all you gotta do is hit the enemy. And it doesn't matter if they block or not, Basically, the more you hit them and the more damage the hit would do or hit or on block, the more health you will recover. However, keep in mind, even though you can recover the health, if you're losing that health, you know, it doesn't count towards your overall health. So if the enemy hits you with, say, a quick few low pokes while you have a lot of recoverable health, you're still gonna die. So it's real damage as far as like winning the rounds concerned. So it really behooves you to get that health back. Also keep in mind, if you do a heat engager, certain heat engagers will actually heal you, right? So it not, won't heal all your health necessarily. It'll heal a good chunk if there's a good chunk to recover, but it's also a good way to make sure you can get health back. If you're low on health, but you have a decent amount of recoverable health, aim for heat engagers, because they will heal you. Also, this is a rare character trait, but certain characters actually have the ability to permanently take away recoverable health. As you hear Nina hit Azucena with the throw, and she just took all of it away. It has that kind of blackish, black and white screen effect there. So off the top of my head, Nina, Dragonov, and Shaheen all have this property on several moves. Maybe one or two other characters, but it's not a very common trait. Also keep in mind, Rage Arts will also delete all recoverable health at the end of the Rage Art. 
So they're also a really good way to keep that comeback mechanic going. Because once that final hit comes, all your potential recoverable health is out the window. So it just makes Rage Arch just a little bit stronger. Now, this section covers something that usually gets people pretty frustrated in Tekken, especially if you don't know what's up. You just got knocked down. Now what, right? Uh, most people, especially if you're newer, you're just going to smash buttons and something will happen. But your options on the ground are very defined. You have very complete control over what happens. So let's talk about it. So let's go with easy option one. You got knocked down, what do you do? Simply hold back. You'll wake up blocking, by the way, and create some space between you and the enemy. So if you want to get away from the enemy as fast as possible, just hold back. Now, conversely, you can either hold down back or up and you'll just get up in place. Once again, just down back or up works either way. You'll just wake up in place. So you're not seating any ground. This is generally the fastest you can stand up and block, by the way. So if you want to be blocking as fast as possible, this is the route you want to go for. Down, back and up work both exactly the same and you can hold back or down back for crouch blocking or stand blocking immediately after the fact. Don't worry, you can do either. But these are the choices you have if you just want to get up quick and just start defending yourself. Another option you have is when you're on the ground, hit forward and you'll roll forward. Debatably, maybe not the smartest thing to do a lot of the time, but it's an option you have. And if you want to take the enemy off their guard while charging at them with a roll while you're getting up, it's an option you have. Another option you have is rolling into or out of the foreground. So if I hit left punch here, if I hit one, notice that I roll to the side a little bit. And conversely, while I'm grounded, if I hit down one, I'll roll into the foreground, right? So if you want to kind of play with the 3D plane a little bit, that is also an option. Of course, you can kind of take the offense to the enemy as well. When you're on the ground, you can do kicks. So if you do three, You'll wake up with a low kick, so it must be blocked low. If you do four, you'll wake up with a mid kick, must be blocked standing. Now, a change in Tekken 8 specifically is these kicks are safe on block. So if the enemy does happen to defend themselves against your specific attack, you are safe. You're negative. You probably lost your turn, right? But you are safe. Now, if you want to get a little more wild here, uh, here's an attack that's mostly universal. Specifically, when your back is on the ground and your feet are towards the enemy. If you hit both kicks together, three and four, you'll do a handstand and kind of spring salt yourself towards the enemy. This is certainly a riskier attack, right? Uh, it's very easy to sidestep and the enemy can get a full punish and all that kind of stuff. But if you're just looking to uh, take the offense back in perhaps the most flashy way possible and uh, one with a bit more range than the usual wake up kicks, it is an option for you. Another option you have only when your back is on the ground and your feet are towards the enemy is hit down in either of the two kicks. And you'll do a toe kick, which is a low, and then you'll roll backwards. So this is a way to maintain a little bit of offense while also trying to defend yourself because you'll hit them and you'll roll back. Now, a very proficient enemy, if they know this is coming, they can stop it, but that predicates that they know that it's coming. Now, another very critical technique is don't worry about being on the ground, right? Uh, these options we went over are specifically when you're just lying on the ground, but you have a little bit of proactiveness you can do. That's what we call the tech roll. So what you want to do is hit buttons just as you hit the ground. And just like, say, the other options where we wake up in place or wake up backwards and block, this is sort of cutting out the middleman. You do the roll and you immediately start blocking. Now you get to choose which direction you roll in. It's quite this simple. If you hit a punch, you roll to your left and it does not matter which punch. It can be one or two, you roll to your left. If you hit a kick, you will roll to your right. And once again here, it can be three or four. It doesn't matter which kick, you roll to your right. Now the nature of the game is simply that uh, sometimes when you hit the ground, you're being comboed, right? So you can't always tech roll. But in a lot of situations where a move is done or a combo is over or whatever, and you get that one last final hit to the ground, that is when you're able to tech roll and then save yourself a lot of trouble getting up. Where tech rolls become incredibly important is some situations like the corner. This is what I see frustrates a lot of people because sometimes you're hit with what looks like you're being hit with the infinite, right? Like, how do you get out? Not possible. Like people like are hitting direction, they're hitting buttons, but as you can see here, oh, I guess it's game over because there's no possible way out, right? Actually, it's very easy to get out. 
So now the enemy is going to tech roll when they can, right? Let's see how this same infinite plays out. So the first part's still a combo, but oh, it's over already. What? So after you get your quote unquote first knockdown from the wall, that is when you're able to do your tech roll. And you can tech roll to the left or right, as we discussed earlier, right? So when you're in that situation against the wall and you are facing the seemingly infinite, whenever the next hit hits you against the wall, just hit one of your buttons and you'll tech roll out and nice and safe. And once again, you can block pretty much right out of the tech roll. So it's a, just a good layer of safety. Do not let yourself be a victim because it's actually quite easy to get out. And for our final section, I'm just here to tell you basically, expect the unexpected. So a lot of what we covered in this video is kind of like basic universal stuff for the most part, but there's a lot of traits in this game that are just only a couple of characters have them. Maybe even only one character has them and you just got to kind of play it by ear. Like just to give a couple examples here, like something like guard break. So the enemy set to block everything, right? Too bad. We have this. And even though you're set to block everything, when we have this, it doesn't matter. Why? Because this glass break effect you're seeing means you can't block anymore. Now, generally, most people who have this effect, they can only get like something small in, but it is going to be completely guaranteed. Say other things like the knockdown section. Some characters have completely unique options while they're knocked down to the ground that nobody else has. Like say Dragonoff here, he has a unique option only to him when he's on his belly, he can kind of slither and then tackle you and then well, beat the crap out of you, right? That is only for him. He shares the same generic options everyone else has, sure, but that's one just for him. And some people have unique knockdown options. Some characters play with health in weird ways, like June, she can hurt herself while doing her moves, but also she has a stance that can heal herself. So some people health is a resource. Some people have self healing. Obviously this is not uh, universal across the board. Basically there's a lot of weird character to character things that no beginner guide can prepare you for. So when you see something that's just truly like, whoa, what's going on? Uh, the answer is you're playing Tekken and Tekken is weird like that. And that's the video. Tekken admittedly is a bit of a hard game to get into, but hopefully with what you've seen in the video, you understand a lot of the core features and a lot of the core functions better than you did before. Tekken's a pretty fun game and it's worth your time and investment. And if you want to know more, keep checking the channel. We already got some Tekken content up, Tekken guides, all that kind of stuff. Plenty more to be in the future, I'm sure. And other than that, well, I hope I helped you out and I guess that's the video. So thank you very much for watching. Hope this video has found you well and go out and play some Tekken. Yeah.